Hi, everybody, and welcome to Brightly Storytime Live. I'm your host, Miss Linda, and I'm so happy to see you all here with me today. Where is everyone tuning in from today? Are you celebrating the beginning of spring, or are the seasons different where you are? The trees here have just recently bloomed, and it's so pretty. I hope wherever you are, you're enjoying the changes. We have a wonderful group of authors and illustrators today who are so excited to share their stories with you. As we get started, a reminder to open up the chat at the bottom of the screen and toggle it to display messages from everyone. We can't wait to hear from you. Oh, after our five stories today, we'll get a chance to hear from the amazing Ben Hoar as he shows us some wonders that can be found in nature. What do you think he's going to show us today? After the demonstration, you'll have a chance to turn your cameras on and share a wonder you found yourself. And if you don't have any on hand, I'd love to see you draw something cool from nature. Oh, I can't wait to see what everyone shares. All right, it's time to welcome our first author to the stage. Everybody say hi to Misha Archer, who is here to read her book, Wonder Walkers. Welcome, Misha. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. We're going to go on a wonder walk. Ready? Here we go. Wonder Walkers by Misha Archer. That's me. Wonder Walkers. Okay. Wonder Walk. Sure. Is the sun the world's light bulb? Is fog the river's blanket? Do mountains have bones? Are forests the mountain's fur? I wonder, me too. Are trees the sky's legs? Are branches, trees, arms? Is dirt the world's skin? Are roots the plant's toes? Do caves have mouths? Are shells the shore's necklace? Is the ocean the world's bath? Are rivers the earth's veins? Is the wind the world's breathing? Is rain the day's tears? Is the moon the world's nightlight? I wonder, me too. So I hope you all will take wonder walks and wonder about everything. Thank you for that lovely story. Oh, you're welcome. Misha, our viewer Rebecca wants to ask, what's the first thing you do when you come up with a story idea? Um, I do a little dance because I'm very happy. <laughs> and then um, I create a little book called a gummy, which is just quick sketches of what I hope the book will look like. And it, it changes a lot, but you can see some of the things are kind of the same. And then I get to start my favorite part where I get to create all kinds of wonderful papers that I can um, then cut up and use to fill my book with different kinds of textures and designs. And I create my papers by making my own little stamps. And this is with uh, inner tube from a bicycle inner tube. And I cut it and I glue it to a piece of wood and that becomes my stamp. And then I also use all kinds of fun 
brushes to create my papers. And when I start cutting things out, sometimes I use these kinds of scissors that have zigzaggies. So collage is a great thing to use because even if you don't know how to draw, you can cut things. So that's what I do. This is my favorite part, making the pictures. <laughs> Writing is, is hard. Well, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for coming, of, everybody. Thanks, Misha. Do any of our viewers at home like to write or draw too? Do you? What do you like to do when you have an idea for a story? <laughs> Those are great answers. That's awesome. Well, next up, we have Carrie Percival to read her book, How to Say Hello to a Worm. Hi, Carrie. Hi everybody, so great to see you all. I wrote this book, How to Say Hello to a Worm. I'd like to read it to you. How do you plant lettuce seeds? Sprinkle, 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 pat, pat, pat. Now make some rain. How do you say hello to a worm? Gently, very gently. Hello, worm. How do you plant peas? Stick your finger in the dirt, a hole. Drop one pea in, give it a drink. Tuck all the peas under the covers. Sweet dreams, peas. How do you say hello to a ladybug? Let her crawl onto your finger, pout her spots. Say, hello, ladybug before she flies away. Have you ever seen so much green? When will the peas sprout? Shh, they're still sleeping. Good morning, pea sprouts. How do you make mud? Dig a path for the water to go. Make a river, flood it. Mix, 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 mm, mud. Look, pea plants. See how they curl around your finger? They want to climb. Let's build a place for them to keep growing. Find some tall sticks, poke them into the ground. Tie the top with string. Ta-da, a play hut. Now you can watch the vines climb up, up, up. How do you say hello to a bee? Look, but don't poke. See the pollen on her feet? Listen, but don't grab. Hear her wings buzzing? If a bee mistakes you for a flower, hold very, very still and whisper, hello, bee. But when will there be peas? See how the play hut is shady? See the flowers? See the bees? You'll see pea pods next. How do you pick a strawberry? This one? Not yet, too green. This one? Not yet, too white. This one? Not yet, too pink. This one? Not yet, too spotted. This one? Yes, now this one. Yum. How do you pull a carrot? A carrot? Where? I don't see any carrots. This carrot. How do you pick peas? Peas? Yes. Finally, peas. Find a pod. Pop it open. Look inside. Peas in a row. Dig one out with your finger. Pop it in your mouth, yum. Wow, look at all we've grown. Has anything ever tasted so sweet? Oh, what a great story, thank you. Oh, thanks so much, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Oh, I did, we all did. So Amy wants to ask, 
what are some of the ways we can help the environment in our homes and our community? Oh, that's such a good question, Amy. And one thing I thought about is um, that you can help the environment by trying to think of ways that you can eat food that doesn't have to travel so far. A lot of food comes from all the way to the other side of the world. And that goes on lots of trucks and boats and planes to get here. So if you just grow your food at home, it has a lot less way to go. Or you can sign up to get a farm share from a local community supported agriculture or buy your food at a local um, farmer's market. That saves a lot of fuel and it really helps the earth a lot. Oh, that's now, an amazing really answer. Yeah, I just wanted to show you a couple quick things. You can buy seeds to plant your own things at home. So you can just grow herbs on your windowsill or you can turn your uh, yard into a garden if you have a yard. Um, sometimes you can find uh, vegetables in your fridge and they have seeds inside. You can actually plant those. Or I also have um, <laughs> potatoes. You can leave them in the windowsill and they'll sprout and you can plant those in the dirt. So there's lots of ways to start a garden at your house. Oh, that's so great. So everyone, did you get any ideas for something to do in your own community? What's something you'd like to try out this year? <laughs> those are great ideas. Thank you. So next, please welcome Ambreen Tarek to read her story, Fatima's Great Outdoors. Take it away, Ambreen. Hi, everyone. Fatima's Great Outdoors. Fatima and her appa stood at the curb and waited for their parents to pick them up from school. Today, they weren't going straight home. Today, the Fazi family was going camping for the first time. Camping, her father had told them over dinner in his teaching voice, was a great American pastime. The trip felt like Fatima's reward after a long, hard week. On Monday, some kids wrinkled their noses at her lunch. On Tuesday, someone in class laughed and told her it's pronounced fractions, not fractions. On Wednesday, a boy pulled on her long braid in the hallway. And on Thursday, she didn't do so well on her math quiz. Fatima smiled when her parents pulled up. The sisters piled into the car, squeezing in between pillows, blankets, and a big cardboard box filled with cooking supplies. Wow, this is a lot of stuff, Fatima yelled. Are we moving to the forest? Mama asked the girls in Urdu if they were excited as she reached back to hand them warm homemade samosas. The girls nodded vigorously with jack-o'-lantern smiles. Mama's samosas always tasted extra delicious on road trips. How about some gani? Papa asked. Mama Drafi's voice rose from the car speakers and Bollywood songs spilled out from the windows. Fatima's cares melted away as they all sang along in Hindi. Appa shouted over the music and announced to the whole car how well she had done on her math homework. Appa's teacher even asked her to come to the front of the class and solve a hard problem on the board that most of the other kids had gotten wrong. Shabash, Papa said with pride. Appa went on and on about school. Fatima slumped in her seat and ate another samosa. As Fatima thought about how to change the topic, her big sister pointed out the window and shouted, look, we're here. The family cheered as they passed the sign for the state park. At the campsite, the girls helped their parents unload. First, Papa said, we must build our tent. Papa and Mama chose to start dinner instead. Fatima watched as Papa took the tent gear out of a sack. Papa grumbled in Urdu when the pieces wouldn't fit. Fatima wanted to help, but could she? She hadn't done anything right at school that week. What would make the campground any different? Fatima took a tiny step closer. 
She suggested to Papa that they read the instruction manual together. When they finished, Fatima stood proudly next to their brand new home in the forest. Shabash, Papa's bear paw clapped her shoulder. The Kazi family celebrated the start of their first camping trip over a delicious dinner of shami kebab and rotis that Mama had brought from home. After dinner, Fatima and Appa crawled into the family tent. They were so excited to snooze in their new sleeping bags. They never had rooms of their own, not even in India. So being together in one big tent felt cozy and right. The girls zipped up their sleeping bags and chattered on as their parents finished cleaning up. Appa was telling Fatima about how she won the class spelling bee when suddenly her face dropped. She gasped and pointed to the tent ceiling. Eight long giant legs gripped the outside of their tent. A monster, the girls screamed and huddled together. They cried out for mama. She was fearless and would know what to do. When they lived in India, mama would catch the lizards and throw them out without flinching. That's how she had that funny finger, Papa said. She had been getting rid of a scorpion from her house when it stung her. The monster moved across the roof and the girls screamed again. What's going on? Mama shouted over the sounds of dishes being washed. The Kazis didn't use paper plates because they were too expensive. Mama, don't open the tent, Papa yelled. There's a giant poisonous spider monster outside. Don't be silly, it's tiny, Mama replied impatiently. Go brush your teeth before bed. Mama held the tent door flaps and on the count of three, the girls ran out. They followed the same precautions coming back inside. One, two, three. They zoomed into their sleeping bags in a single fluid motion. That night, Fatima had a hard time falling asleep. Crickets chirped and wind blew against their tent. She flinched every time a twig snapped. But soon, as the trees swayed outside, Fatima's eyes got heavy and she drifted into a warm, deep sleep that only campers enjoy. Soft snores drifted outside the Kazi's, fam the Kazi's tent and joined the sounds of the forest. The next morning, Fatma woke up to the smell of anda and roti cooking in ghee. Papa was waiting for her to make the bacon over a roaring fire. He had promised Fatima they could have bacon for breakfast just like the other American families. They had even made a special trip to the halal butcher shop for the beef kind. Baharajao, Papa called for them to come outside. The sisters crept out slowly. Mama pointed at the top of the tent between chuckles. Go look at your big monster, she said. A harmless little daddy long leg sat quietly between beads of morning dew. It had been guarding them from mosquitoes all night. The girls laughed and laughed. Mama and Papa laughed too. Fatma was pretty sure the spider joined in as well. Let's start the campfire so we can make the smoky bacon you've been so excited about, Fatma, Papa said. 20 minutes later, there still was no campfire. Papa grumbled under his breath in Urdu. The fire wouldn't catch. Fatima looked around at the other families' campsites and they all had roaring fires. Why couldn't theirs look like that? Why did Fatima's family always have to be so different? She pouted and kicked rocks. Papa kept spraying lighter fluid on the lawns. The fire would scream for a second and then it would be gone. Mama came over to see what all the fuss was about. She shook her head and clicked her teeth in disapproval, the way Fatima's aunties did. That's not how you start a fire. Let me show you, she said. A fire, like strength, takes patience to build. She made the girls gather twigs and dry leaves for kindling, then bigger sticks for tinder. Unlike Papa, who grew up in big cities in India, 
Mama came from a small town where they had to use a wood burning stove outside to make chai when they ran out of gas for the inside stove. Fatima remembered visiting her nani's house and helping one morning. Mama showed Fatima how to use a long metal pipe to breathe oxygen into the fire. That's how it comes alive, she had said. Fatima remembered that when it was her turn, she'd blown a giant puff of air into the fire, but no one told her not to inhale right after. She got a mouthful of smoke and started coughing. Her cousins had howled with laughter at the city girl. Well, now you know, Mama had said, rubbing Fatima's back as she coughed. Fatima smiled at the memory and watched wide-eyed as Mama blew life into the campfire. Though Fatima hadn't built the fire herself, now she knew how. The Kazi family packed up. As the Kazi family packed up, Fatima's heart felt heavy. I'm so sad, she told Appa. I don't want to go home. Home meant no laughing around the campfire or telling funny stories from India. Home meant no long road trips with fresh samosas and Bollywood sing-alongs in the car. Home meant taking tests, doing homework, getting in trouble and being teased at school. Home meant Mama and Papa would be tired again from working long hours and two jobs each. Fatima looked at the tall trees and the big blue sky and the imprints in the dirt where their tent used to stand. Being outdoors reminded her of how she used to feel in India. She had fun, she didn't feel sad or scared, and she loved how adventure was around every corner. At the campground, Fatima felt like a superhero. But now she had to leave it all behind. Papa rubbed Fatima's back and said, don't worry, we'll be back soon. Remember, you can share all this at show and tell. Fatima returned to school with stories of her great outdoors. Guess what? She asked her classmates. I'm a superhero. I have lots of superpowers. I can build fires and tents and I'm not afraid of spider monsters. Fatima beamed as she thought about what the Kazi family's next camping adventure would hold. The end. Oh, what a sweet story. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So one of our audience members, Bridget, would like to ask you, do you share your books while they're in progress for feedback from family or friends? That's a fun question because um, I'm actually not an career storybook author. This story is actually my story. It's the story of my family. So I, this isn't fiction. It's sort of memories put together. So I actually wanted to surprise my parents with this book. I didn't tell them anything about it and then showed up one day and handed it to them. But as I was working on it, I showed, um, I would share little clips with my sister, who is Appa. Appa is the word, it's not her name, it's the word that in our language we call big sister. So I would share little snippets with her and then she would remind me about certain memories and experiences that we had together. And that was the only person other than that and my editor that I was sharing my copies with. And unlike our other brilliant authors on this panel, you know, I'm, I'm not a career author. So for me, it's about memories that I'm putting together in this, in this book. So it's a really fun question. That's amazing. Congrats on your book. Thank you so much. And thank you for your question. Oh, thank you. So does anyone else like to share stories with their family? How do you like to tell them? Oh, there are so many ways to express yourself. So next up, we have Ashley Wolf, who illustrated Compost Stew. Oh, we're so happy to have you here today to share your story, Ashley. And uh, I can't start my video. It says that the host has disabled it. Oh no, give us just a moment. We'll get that taken care of. Okay, there, there you got are. it, got it. Okay, um, hello and, and thank you for having me today. I am so happy to talk about a book that I've loved now for 12 years. Um, anybody who knows about books knows that books don't always stay in print for, for all that long. 
but this one is just getting better and better because people, more people are composting. I want to thank Mary McKenna Siddles for writing this fantastic um, text. It's one of the best rhyming texts I've ever had the pleasure to work with. So I will read it. Environmental chefs, here's a recipe for you to fix from scratch, to mix a batch of compost stew. Ingredients, apple cores, bananas bruised, coffee grounds with filters used, dirt clods crumbled, eggshells crushed, fruit pulp left behind, all mushed, grass clippings, hair snippings, and an insect or two. Just add to the pot and let it all rot into compost stew. Save jack-o'-lanterns, kitchen scraps, laundry lint from dryer traps, mulch removed from garden beds, nutshells, oatmeal, paper shreds, quarry dust, rye bread crust, and seaweed strands, a few. Just add to the pot and let it all rot into compost stew. Take tea bags plucked from long hot swimmings, underbrush prunings, vegetable trimmings, Wiggly worms with compost cravings, Xmas tree needles, yellow pine shavings, and zinnia heads from flower beds whose blooming days are through. Just add to the pot and let it all rot into compost stew. Moisten, toss lightly, cover, let brew. And when the cooking is complete, Mother Earth will have a treat. Dark and crumbly, rich and sweet. Now open the pot. And what have you got? Compost stew. There's a little chef's note at the end that I want to read because it um, <clears throat> it's beautifully written. Out of pumpkins, low on flies, get creative improvise. You can always substitute any veggie, plant, or fruit, but please recycle these instead. They don't break down, so not a shred of metal, plastic, packing foam, or chemicals found in the home. What's, what's more, no meat or dairy, please. They won't break down. No bones or gravy, fish or cheese, for these will cause an awful smell attracting animals as well. Earthy, yes, meaty, no, synthetic, stop, natural, go. So spice it up, but be judicious. Keep it wholesome and nutritious. Mother Earth will say delicious compost stew. Oh, thank you for that rhyming story. Well, I had nothing to do with the rhymes. I did the illustrations and I did them out of compost. <laughs> Uh, there's lots of compostable elements in each collage illustration, like nutshells, eggshells, seaweed, um, hair, insects, laundry lint, a wow. um, couple, couple dozen more. Oh, that's so neat. So our viewer, Josephine, wants to ask you, what does nature look like on a walk around your neighborhood? <sighs> oh, Josephine, I live so far north that spring is barely here. Um, we have no leaves, no flowers. Well, I, I take that back. I have a little crocus, um, but it's raining and it's 41 degrees. And um, we are still in the April showers, May flowers phase of spring. But I can, I walk in the woods. I live way down in the country in Vermont, surrounded by um, the Green Mountain National Forest. So there's lots of trees, there's lots of moss, there's a little stream. There are, um, sometimes I can see Eastern newts crossing my path. And I saw some blue spotted salamanders the other day. 
oh, and wow. her wood frogs and peepers. <laughs> How neat. So everyone else, what does it look like when you walk through your own neighborhood? <laughs> Thank you. Now let's all welcome Megan Wagner Lloyd to read her story, Finding Wild. Hi, Megan. Hi, everybody. Finding Wild. What is wild and where can you find it? Wild is tiny and fragile and sweet baby new. It pushes through cracks and crannies and steals back forgotten places. Sometimes wild is so tricky, you have to squint to see it. And then there are times you can't possibly miss it. Wild creeps and crawls and slithers. It leaps and pounces and shows its teeth. Wild is full of smells, fresh mint, ancient cave, sun-baked desert, sharp pine, salt sea every scent begging you to drink it in. Wild is forest fire hot and icicle cold. It's as smooth as the petals of poppies and as rough as the fierce face of a mountain. Watch out, wild can hurt. Itch, burn, out, sting. But wild can also soothe gentle breeze, cheering sun, soft rain. Wild keeps many secrets waiting to be discovered, like it's candy, honey from bees and sap from trees, swift melting snowflakes and juice bursting blackberries. Wild roars and barks and hisses and brays. It storm thunders and wind whispers, wild sings. Sometimes wild is buried too deep and it seems like the whole world is clean and paved, ordered and tidy. You look and look and all you can see are streets and cars and buildings so high, they hide the sky. And then, just when you are about to give up, there, there it is again. Old and worn and still standing strong. Wild. Oh, what a beautiful story. So Megan, a viewer named Parker would like to ask you, when you write the words for a story, do you have a picture in your mind of what the book will look like? Or do you like to be surprised by the illustrator's ideas? Hi, Parker. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a little bit of a mix of both. So for this book, for Finding Wild, then the words were written by me and the illustrator. It's an artist named Abigail Halpin. And for some of the parts, like at the end, where they're like looking for a wild and they can't really find it, I thought that that would probably be like I was imagining that maybe they were in the city or in an area with not as many trees or plants. Um, but I don't really imagine like the specifics, like I don't imagine exactly what the characters look like or exactly what's going to be on the page, because it's really important to me when I working with an illustrator that they feel like they can really bring their creativity on board and they can imagine um, what they think it looks like since we're um, making the book as a team. That's so interesting and we love teamwork. So everyone, which approach would you prefer? Next up is our final author, who is going to be sharing with us today some of the amazing things you can find in nature. 
So I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Ben Hoar, author of Wonders of Nature. Welcome, Ben. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm speaking to you from uh, Great Britain, so quite a long way away, probably. And it's a beautiful spring day where I am, and I hope it's beautiful where you are too. So I want to take us on a treasure hunt today. Do you all want to come on a treasure hunt with me? Okay, but there's a little twist. We're going to look for nature's treasures. So what is a nature's treasure? Well, I wrote a whole book about nature's treasures and a nature's treasure is anything natural. So it could be made by a plant or an animal or by the earth itself, like a stone. There are thousands of these treasures all around us. And what I want us all to do today, this afternoon, is to be inspired to go out of our apartments and our homes into our gardens and our yards and our parks and try and find some of these treasures for ourselves. Uh, so I've got a few that I have here to show you just to give you a bit of an idea what I'm talking about. So here's one I found. Now, does anybody know what that is? That's a dandelion, very common flower. We have it in Britain, you have it in uh, North America as well. That's just an example of a nature's treasure you might find. Here's another one. That's a flower called a primrose. Primrose means first rose because it's one of the first flowers that we see in Britain after, after winter. So I'm hoping you can get the idea here. Here's another one. See if you can guess what this is. This is easy. Okay, it's a seashell. You can find shells like that by, by rivers as well. Here's another one. Now, I, this is one of my favorites, okay? So, this is an owl feather, okay? And if you look at the left-hand side of the feather, you can see the feather is really kind of messed up. It's got frayed ends, like split ends in hair. And that's what makes the owl fly quietly. And every bird all over the world has got different feathers. Here's a pretty spectacular one, peacock feather. And the male peacock has loads of these in his tail to impress the female peahen. And the whole, the whole thing that's great about going on a treasure hunt, it's free, it's fun. And there's loads of different things to find. You know, there are hundreds of different feathers. Spring is quite a good time to find feathers on the floor. It's also a good time to find eggshells because baby birds hatch. The eggshells often end up on the ground or the parent birds take the eggshells out of the nest and then drop them somewhere else. Now, this is not one you're gonna find, okay guys? <laughs> Does anybody know what laid that egg? Okay, I'm gonna, this is the world's largest bird's egg. That's a clue, okay? Does anyone have an idea? This is seriously big. The reason I'm showing you this, well, it's kind of fun. I didn't find this in the park. This is an ostrich egg, okay? But every egg is a miracle of nature. If you feel the egg, the surface of the egg, it's got these little rough bits, these little pimples, these little spots. And that is how the baby bird inside the egg can breathe through the egg while it's developing. So an egg is a kind of, it's this beautiful package for a little baby bird. And then when it's ready, it will hatch out. And for an ostrich, the ostrich chick has got to work really hard to get out of this. You know, apparently people can stand on an ostrich egg and it won't break. I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> um, here's another nature's treasure that you might find. OK, now this is really beautiful. I'm guessing you all know what this is. Yeah. This is a bird's nest, okay? Now, if you don't wanna to touch these things, that's absolutely fine. You can just look at them, you can describe them, ask an adult to take a picture on, on their phone, sketch it, 
just keep a list. You know, there's loads of ways of enjoying nature. You don't have to touch and collect if you don't want to. But this is a bird's nest. And what I think is amazing is that the, the birds that made this, um, there's no plan. Um, they're not following a plan. When, when the bird hatches, it already knows how to make its nest when it's, when it's grown up. It's all, that's called instinct. Um, and each type of bird, each species of bird makes a different type of nest. So this one is kind of a finch. Now you have finches in North America. This is obviously one we have in Britain. And this beautiful soft inside to the nest is made by the female finch turning her body round and round inside to get this beautiful cup for her eggs to sit in. Now, I've got a quiz. I've got a quiz now. Okay, this is another nature's treasure. Now, it's a pine cone, okay? So if you find a pine tree, which are those trees that kind of have those needles, you know, the leaves, they're like sharp needles. So you may have a pine tree in your yard, if not, maybe in the local park. You know, you don't have to go to a wilderness to see these treasures. Any city that has a park or a bit of green space, you can find these things. So my, my quiz question, my question, this is a pine cone, okay? Why do you think the pine cone is so tough and strong, okay? It feels like it's made of wood, okay? This is a kind of serious, this is a kind of seriously strong thing, isn't it? Why, why is it like this? So if I give you a clue, I'll give you a clue, okay? The pine cone is how the pine tree spreads its seeds, okay? So in here, underneath each of these, um, if I turn it, underneath each of these um, little spiky bits is a seed or two seeds hiding, waiting. And this is how the pine, key, the pine tree, sorry, stores and spreads its seeds. But why does it put its seeds in something that looks like that? What could possibly be strong enough to want to eat the seeds of a pine tree, okay? Why, why is it so strong? And I'll give you a little clue as well. It might not be an animal that's still alive today, okay? It might be something that lived a long time ago. Here's another pine cone. Okay. Now this one is from an American tree called the giant redwood, so which is uh, grows in California, but you may see it in parks. I found this in a park. And what I think is cool is the giant redwood is one of the world's biggest trees, right? But it has tiny pine cones. <laughs> okay. So one of the fun things about looking for nature's treasures is you're helping to tell, you're helping to learn about the world around you, okay? Because all these things exist for a reason and they're all different and their shapes are beautiful. And I think this is, you know, it's a really nice way, if there's any adults listening, it's a really nice way of engaging, of looking at and being with nature. Because, you know, animals and birds, and they're gonna fly away, they can be frightened of you. A pine cone and a, a feather and a flower, they're not gonna run away from you. So it's a really nice way to get close to nature. And you can do some fantastic art projects with Nature's Treasures. So I've got three great suggestions for you, okay? So the first one, we've had, we've had some brilliant collages already this evening. Now, my daughters made this, okay? So what they did was we went to the local park and we collected leaves, okay? So we did this in the fall last year and we tried to find as many different kinds of leaves as we could. And then we used the internet and books to try and find the names of each tree. Um, yeah, I thought for a minute it was upside down. <laughs> Okay, so you can do that. Choose a theme. It could be leaves, it could be feathers, it could be shells. See how many of that kind of thing you can find. Here's another craft activity. Now this is called the mandala, okay? Very, very easy. Just go and collect as many leaves as you can. You can also do this with shells or pine cones and you just make a beautiful circular pattern on the ground. You could put your favorite treasure in the middle of it, for example, take a photo of it afterwards, draw a picture. That's a fun activity. And then the final thing you can do is to choose an adjective, a describing word like smooth, rough, 
tiny, huge, and look for things that match that describing word. So these are ways you can go out and have fun in nature. Oh, those are such great ideas, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone, sure. what was your favorite idea? What was your favorite item? Oh, and Ben, nice shirt. Oh, <laughs> yes. I've, got to answer, I've got to answer the quiz question. Shall I do it okay. super quick? Yes, do tell us the okay. answer. So did anybody guess why this pine cone is, is like this? Did we have any guesses? I've not got my chat open. I don't think we know. What's the answer? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Yeah. So pine trees, the first pine trees were here millions of years ago, right? And so when the first pine trees on earth were developing ways to protect their seeds, they wanted to make sure dinosaurs couldn't get hold of them. That's, that's the best theory people have. Wow. Nature is so amazing. Thank you, Ben. Now I'd like to invite everyone, all of you, to share your wonder with everyone else. If you have something that you'd like to share, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen to let our Brightly Helpers 